Now, this video is a surprisingly hard video to make. It really is, because normally, well, for me, I would just go to a, a couple of books, check through them, and I go to my own sources, my own teaching materials, and I produce a video that way. Why is this surprisingly hard? Because for this period, if I wanted to give you a Bible to go look at, to base your work from, and please note, this is not something I necessarily agree with 100%, because let's be honest, even Andrew Lambert's work, which and he is an, ac an academic god, my former PhD supervisor, and using a phrase which my mother had just taught me recently, the closest I have to an academic Oshi, who I, you know, would push for. I don't agree with everything he says. For Norman Freeman, whether it's British carriers or American carriers, I don't agree with everything he says. I've met him on several occasions. He's a wonderful guy. He's a great guy to have a wonderful debate with and discussion with. And the fact that most of what we disagree on is context and nuance and its interpretation is something which I really love because we can have really interesting conversations. There's like five people I can have that discussion with about the minutiae of aircraft carrier development in the 1930s and 1920s. It's Prof Lambert, it's Norman Freeman, it's Marcus Faulkner, it's Drac, and it's someone who I'm not allowed to name on on a video because they don't like to be on the, they don't like to be on social media. That's it pretty much. That's who I can have that level of discussion with. And I love that. But don't you notice there's a bit of a thing missing here because Norman's done the greats of carrier development, the great carrier aviation development and yes, I don't agree with everything he writes in them and I draw from different lists, but again, in the British example, I just have a far more time to go through the archives than he does. He's visiting the UK. He's from America, and I have also figured that I understand some of the British subtax better than probably he did when he did his first book in the air over here. But that's an advantage. But if I'm doing the same for the Japanese Navy, there is no Norman Freeman's Guide to Japanese Aircraft Carriers. There isn't. And that's a really big gap. Why isn't there? Well, as Norman would tell you himself, there is a lot of issues with gathering information together. And please excuse the room. I'm currently in the process of packing up. Well, to start off with, here's one book, The Imperial Japanese Navy. And this will give you some of the bits you will find in Nor equivalent to Nor what Norman's got in his aircraft carriers book. But it won't give you all of them. It'll give you the units you can find them in, where the, the officers are, what they're doing. It's great, but it's not really something that you give to someone to read. There's Kaigen. It's exceptional. It's a strategy, tactics, and technology in the Imperial Japanese Navy. It's wonderful. But it's not a quick read, and it's, it's not exactly the full, or it's not entirely focused on aircraft carriers. Um... This book is something which I'm going to be coming to. Um, yes, this one. Later on, I've got to row out. Uh, but it's we haven't finished translating yet. Me and Draken are fellow working on it. I've got this one, which is Japanese Carriers of Victory in the Pacific, which is Marta Southfield, which is very good because it looks at where a lot of the stuff comes from. We have Peter Edwards' book. Now, Peter was an RAF officer. And apart from having a mild, and I realize this was published after he died by his son, so I'm very careful how I approach it. He has some very interesting statements about Anglo-Japanese relations, in that I think he, from the statements, he seems to believe that if the Anglo-Japanese alliance had continued, World War II wouldn't have happened and the Empire wouldn't have fallen I'm not quite sure. They're, they're just uh, just a, to a, a sight sides. The rest of it's very, very good. And as the reality of the time was actually very, was very, very complex. And I said, and there are some people who have hope 
in that relationship. There's me looking at the relationship and the way that Japan was disintegrating internally, and the British made an honest decision. We've got Japan, which is fighting amongst itself, and we don't know who we're going to be dealing with in five, t in five minutes, let alone in five days or five years' time, or we can uh, side with the Americans. And honestly, the empire crumbled because we were already trans transforming it towards the Commonwealth. That was already the direction we were going in. And um, World War One, World War Two, and the Great Depression happened within a 30-year time span. And a global trading empire, which depended upon maritime trade and the flow of goods to keep itself going and keep itself together... Uh, that's kind of three massive disruptions into the flow of international trade. I can't think why that mucked up the empire. But here's a little trick for also for people who are wondering how Britain got an empire. If you consider in the Napoleonic Wars, which was the largest economy which wasn't getting beaten up and traipsed over on a regular basis? And then look at the course of World War One, World War II, World War One. Britain doesn't get gets economy adjusted, but doesn't get trampled over. Does fairly well. World War Two, we get bombed and all sorts of things happen, and we have to rebuild after that. America doesn't. That's the lesson. If you want to be involved in a major war, best to not be the country getting smashed up. You'll come out richer for it. It was such a surprise to people when they look at the course events and you go, no, there's simple logic to it. And then we have this one by Mark Still. Now, probably the closest to a single source guide you will get, equivalent to a Freeman book, is Still's book. Clo probably the closest. But in order to get the full rounded development, you do need to go through the other four texts here. So, for that reason... The reading list, despite what you are going to see in terms of actual content, looks incredibly Japanese-centric. Principally because I've got two books which will do as the baseline reference points for the British and the American navies. And their carries, and their very good core text to work from. And there are other books I can point to. There are other books which will give you wider reading. But I can't give you what I can't give you an equivalent text for the Japanese. So up in front of the camera again, so you can see them all. There they are. Isn't life fun? Someday, someday. But back to today's actual topic, not just the information for the topic. Well, the first carriers we're talking about conversion scratch belts. Now, I'm being very specific. Okay. There is a very specific criteria. Basically, the time frame is HMS Furious. That's the time period we're talking about. We're talking about the conception of Furious changing and her evolution, and that's the period when we're really talking about the first carriers and conversion scratch belts, because by the time we get to the Lexingtons, and Courageous, and Glorious, and people are going, oh, they are, they're, they're, they're first carriers, they're not, they're treaty carriers. They're treaty carriers, okay? So, they're not. But, Furious, Eagle, Argus, Hermes, Hosha, Langley, they're not. They're something different. And here's the first nugget of information you may not have known. Hosho was going to have a sister ship called Shakako. Yes, she was never built. The IJN got the funds for her. The IJN actually got the funds out of the Army-Navy-Aviation Joint Funds for her. They never built her. There you go. There is going to be a lot of information in this video as we go through it. It's going to be a lot of discussion. It's not going to be heavy on the details of the individual ships. So if you're looking for individual ship details, keep an eye out for the key ships videos, which are going to be about them. 
It's about the process going on around them, about what's feeding into their design, why they're developing the way they are, some of the testing, some of the developments. And I hope you're going to enjoy it. I really do. But I wanted you to have an idea of what content was going to be, where the content in there came from, and where you could go and read up some more of it for yourself, because, yeah. Uh, my PhD thesis should soon be able to be found online. It's, it's embargo period will soon be over. And that should be cool. And people should be able to go read that. But you always have to remember that PhD thesis. I started off planning on doing that same process on the US Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, as well as the Royal Navy. And I did all the research and actually wrote a couple of the chapters for the other navies. But the trouble is it got to 110,000 words. And it was supposed to be 100,000 words, give or take 10%. And that was with the, they was heading for that already. And so in order to have a summary and a conclusion and actually include the stuff in the literature review, which was, because I, I tried to prune the literature review dramatically to try and get more stuff in. I thought I could maybe get away with it. Um, again, supervisor was excellent. They'd give me some advice on how to do it and did my best. And no, the examiners didn't agree. So... Basically, America and Japan got cut, and you can actually tell those bits were written because there are some references to those bits in the, some of the British chapters, which are, I have tried to rewrite so that they have the information in them, but you can sort of see, like, hang on, in this one note, there was obviously another section added into this work, but I think, honestly with them in, the book would, the, the thesis would have probably been somewhere in the region of, I think I was heading for about 180 to 200,000 words. And that would have been well over. That would be enough for two PhD theses. <laughs> so, first carriers, conversions, and scratch builds. That's today's topic, and yeah, basically it's otherwise known as what was happening while Furious transitioned from whatever we're going to call Furious, and when she starts life, she's certainly not a battle cruiser. I don't think she even qualifies as a large light cruiser. Uh, maybe a monitor with a flying off station, considering she has a single 18-inch gun and a flying off deck forward. So, single 18-inch gun aft. I, that doesn't qualify as a... So, as someone tried to really tried to put a trail me that that was a battle cruiser. I went, that's not... Then they said, it's a, the first battle carrier, and I went, it's not. Cruiser carrier? It's not. <laughs> it's just not. It's just bad. Okay, it's just bad. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Uh, and basically, it's her lifespan and the ships that start in her lifespan. So it should be cool, and I, I hope you will enjoy this topic as we go through it. And before I start, shame to put plug always do a shameless book plug, my own bo a book, and remember the fun thing was I couldn't, and I have never been able to get the carrier work turned into a book, the people tell me there are just too many books about carriers, and frankly it wouldn't go through, and that's that's fine, I said the PhD will not be embargoed soon, so people will download it for free and therefore I'll never be able to turn it into a book because if it's able to be downloaded for free no publisher wants it can I understand that one and um yeah, I will... But this this research did actually start with the PhD. Because the ships kept turning up in the discussions of the British aircraft carriers. And it was really interesting when I was doing some research around the American and the Japanese ships. And it was... The really interesting thing for me was that... The Americans and the Japanese, the navies were less worrying about having a specific escort for an aircraft carrier. Um, the British, basically, it's one of the lesser known jobs of the tribal class and of the large fleet gunnery, uh, large fleet or gunnery destroyer, was that it was supposed to be the carrier escort. And the reason they wanted as carrier escort is, if you're defending a carrier, what do you like to defend carrier against? Submarines. If there's an air, if there's a ship attacking, yeah, you'll need a large ship, you'll need torpedoes. 
But what's the other likely threat for a carrier to be facing? Enemy destroyer attack, enemy torpedo uh, destroyers, and those things coming in, especially at night, to try and get into the group, to try and get the big targets. Torpedo boats. Gun destroyer, good for dealing with that. A good for keeping that away from the carrier. And so that was on their criteria. Them and the Dido class to the cruisers. That was literally, that, that program, that entire program of light cruisers and uh, it comes initially, there's about three studies which feed into it, and one of those is the carrier protection study. Um, that's what I'm calling it. It's not what it was called. It was given a whole full naval name, which means, uh, which, very long, and then you read it into it, and you go, oh, this is about protecting the carriers. Uh, what was it? Was it pre uh, protection of aviation aviation units or something like that? It was it's 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 a really it's a really cool about twelve word long title actually. Um, I'll look it up in my notes. But yeah, that's where these started, and that's where this book came from, and it's currently the only book I have out. So. Thank you for everyone who's bought it, and thank you everyone who's continuing to support it. There's a competition which is just finished uh, in terms of being able to be a have entries in. I am reading through the entries. I am also moving house, but I am reading through all the entries. I'm managing to read through two a night. And so I've that's going to be about two weeks of me reading through, and then roughly half of the ten, uh, at least ten, maybe as many as half of the entries will go to the judging panel and we'll see how quickly they get through them and then we'll get back with the results. And there'll be a full brew ships which will be about the results. It'll be fun. But yes, let's start off with Furious. Oh, Furious. And how did this come about? How, in a world where Jackie Fisher has managed to mangle a battleship, uh, three, let's say, Three battleships, four battleships, including Argencourt, and he's got the two Renowns, which are fairly good out of it, and he's got the Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. Or, uh, <clears throat> yeah, 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 I'm not going to do their names, they're a bit rude, the nicknames they came up with a bit rude, but you can comment down below what you think they are, just remember, my little cousins watch the channel. And this was HMS Furious. And she didn't even get completed with a forward 18-inch gun. Because the moment someone sane got back in charge, the first thing they did was, What the frigate are these frigating things for? What are they? Here is the really interesting thing about Furious. Even as she's being built, the Navy doesn't know what to do with her. They don't know what to do with Courageous and Glorious. Fisher has gone. Fisher goes as First Sea Lord in 1915. In fact, he goes in May 1915. The trouble is, he goes too late. The contracts have already been ordered, and she is laid down on 8th of June 1915. He is moved off to the Board of Invention and Research and become chairman of that, and of course Winston Churchill goes off to actually be a brigadier in the... In, the trenches and that happens a lot of people in the navy are left with oh frigate what do we do with these things this is why she's not actually completed with Mar with the second 18 inch gun in fact during her construction she's changed while being constructed before she's even launched before the Battle of Jutland, there's a whole sort of mythology. It's after Battle of Jutland, they go, we really need this. No, before the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy's already going, well, hang on, she's going to be quite fast. She's quite long. Why are we giving them single 18-inch guns? It just doesn't work. I'm fairly sure there's a few naval constructors who are really annoyed that their battleship project got ruined by Fisher's follies. But we'll leave that to one side. What they sort of start to come round with the idea is, well, okay, we'll leave one gun on her just because that means she's going to have a gun. 
and we're not really sure what to do. But we could, we've could we got all this data about flying off decks. We've got all this data about these operations of aircraft. And really, we want to be able to launch aircraft and perhaps recover them at sea. There was an idea about having them actually recover from forward as well. <laughs> Very quickly, that one was dropped. The idea of the ship moving forward and the aircraft landing straight into the superstructure. <laughs> there might have been a few Royal Navy officers going... I like my face. <laughs> this is not a good idea for me. But no, they, they're already thinking, we need these aircraft. We need aircraft for spotter duties. We need aircraft for reconnaissance duties. We need aircraft for air defense against, to go, well, air defense as it was, was to go and shoot down zeppelins. So counter reconnaissance duties. I... The enemy can't strike you if they can't don't know where you are because you've shot down their aircraft which were hunting for you, hunting you. It works. And so Furious goes for an evolution. And she gets completed looking like this. This abomination. <laughs> Come on. It, it, there is no one sitting there going, what is she? What is she for? Is she a monitor which can do her own spotting? Honestly, that is probably better than what Fisher was planning for. The Baltic plan works. It can work. If you defeated the High Sea Fleet, you can force the Baltic. And you can carry on the blockade on the Baltic coast of Germany. And you can completely shut down their economy. Because even their coastal traffic can't flow... And they can't import through the in the uh, through the um, neutrals of Scandinavia. They can't do anything like that. Yeah, that that does work if you manage to make it. I I don't really see these large light cruisers, these Fisher's Follies. These some people do still call them battle cruisers, but they're not. They are not in any stretch of the imagination battle cruisers. Um, actually being really necessary for it. They, the theory is they could go through the shallower channel and they could charge through that while the rest of the fleet had to concentrate on the deeper channel which gives them an option and stops the enemy being able to block them. But honestly, so can regular cruisers and destroyers and the fact is the Royal Navy has an overwhelming superiority in numbers of those things to send through and... Let the Harwich Force do it. That's it. Let the Harwich Force do it. Just let them charge through. That that That's the plan. That's a sensible plan. The Harwich Force, Commodore Turret, go through, do your job. He will do it. His forces will do it. Those destroyers and cruisers will do the duty. You don't need to build these things to go with them. You really don't. And so, it gets completed. Because aviation is already being recognised as an important thing. And one of the really cool things you have to consider with all the aviation programs going on is that the Americans and the Japanese are being invited to this. The Japanese earlier than the Americans. Why? Because the Japanese are fighting as allies with Britain in this war. And it's known that the Japanese are very strong naval allies of Britain. So having them over for projects, having them involved, makes sense. And there are a lot of their officers coming across for it. In fact, if we go to Peter Edward's book, and um, I'm going to read you the full section. In England, Lieutenant Commander Keneko of the Na uh, Imperial Japanese Navy had arrived, this is 1917, with the Centre of Studying the New British Technique of Landing on the Deck of the Aircraft Carriers. Post the HMS Furious, he participated in flying activities and air research, learning the method of landing and taking off from this new class of ship. Eventually, he returned to Japan and, in the course of his writing, proposed the construction of both aircraft and aircraft carriers. Imperial Naval staff in Tokyo were very impressed with the organization and administration of the British Royal Naval Air Service, and in particular the findings enumerated in reports of Lieutenant Commander Kaneko, who was returned home in 1918. As a consequence, orders were placed with the Sopwith Aircraft Company of Kingston upon Thames, Surrey, for delivery of six Sopwith T1 Cuckoo single seat torpedo bomber biplanes. These machines were equipped with one 200 horsepower Wolseley Viper engine, and eventually they became the model for all subsequent Japanese torpedo bombers. Uh, the last statement is a completely, um, it's a nice idea to think, but it's not true. Uh, the thing is, though, it was the Japanese introduction in the idea of torpedo bombing. But 
and in terms of from a, from a takeoff and landing of a carrier, so a dedicated torpedo bomber, which is a stri which is a strike aircraft. They'd already carried out torpedo attacks with aircraft already in the war themselves. So had the British. It was nothing new to them. They're already enamoured with the idea. The top with Cuckoo does not begin it. And the top with Cuckoo does not become the template for Japanese torpedo bombers afterwards, because it's very easy to see it doesn't. When you look at them, and when you look at their design history and the design teams involved. Now, in the case of this, you might notice that he's talking about landing on, and um, as I mentioned, you can't land on this ship. Well, that's because it goes through changes. But before we get to changes, comes Argus. Yes, there were some interesting discussions. Very interesting discussions. In so, under the video last week, which was about the Kaiserliche Marine and its development of aircraft carriers, and some people sort of made the suggestion, well, you know, the Amer the Germans were pushing for these ideas, had all these ideas that, you know, and they're so small. What are the British doing? The British are actually building them. That's what the British are doing. The British are building them. In 1916, they start the process of creating, and honestly, they've been working on it since about 1914. They've had ideas for full flight deck ships. And it's getting time and getting to do it. Because when you have they have a lot of more ships to deal with. They have a lot larger things going on. And their primary thing they've been dealing with as a design team has been producing all the monitors, all the short-term war-only builds which they have to build for the war. Yes, there are some vessels which are taken over, which were supposed to be given to the Norwegians or the Swedes. Uh, Norwegians, I think they were mainly, but there was also one which was considered at one point potentially going to Sweden. And um, the British just take them over. And are using them as monitors. But a lot of monitors are wartime emergency builds. A lot of escorts are wartime emergency builds. There's all the flag class sloops. There's all sorts of things and projects going through. Britain building in World War One is churning out a massive amount of ships. A truly gargantuan amount of ships. Especially when you compare them to the actual production of the Kaiserliche Marine. And what it's able to get out of German industry. And that's understandable. Let's let's consider here. If Britain was fighting a ground war with its neighbours, and there are literal trenches stretching across hundreds of miles, thousands of miles of territory, that's going to take first colony resources rather than a navy. It is. The artillery, all the stuff, all the material supplies needed for that, it's going to take first calling resources. It does. In the case of Argus, in the case of Argus, the Royal Navy works on it. Why do they not push it more through more quickly? Why do they not use earlier ships? Because they're using them for other things. Honestly, they are. Argus's story itself is pretty darn interesting. How it comes to be is a pretty interesting course of events. So, the Royal Navy starts thinking about aircraft carriers and full-length flight deck carriers in about 1910. That's when we can first really point to some actual physical sources and actual discussions going on. This is certainly why Beardmore and Company produced their design proposal in 1912, because they've heard about the discussions and they're going, what do you think about this? It was a continuous full-length flight deck. It also had a bridge structure which was quite literally a bridge over the ship. I mean, literally it was an island sort of either side and the bridge and the aircraft would land and take off. It It's a really intriguing, intriguing development point of, oh my lord, that's going to be a lot of accidents when you know what you know, uh, what we now know about naval aviation and operations. It it would have been a good way to kill a lot of pilots. Probably would have been okay while the aircraft were reasonably slow. But, oh my lord. <laughs> I mean, the aircraft by 1920 standards would have been smashing off that thing. 
But it is kind of interesting that the Royal Navy is playing around with it, but they're not really doing anything. However, however, there is a interesting little circumstance, and there is a region that Argus herself comes from Beardmore and Company, because they do a lot of cruise liners, a lot of ocean liners work, and uh, they have two large Italian ones, the Conte Rosso and the Giglio Cesare. Under construction. And they both met the Royal Navy's criteria for an aircraft carrier, and the Royal Navy purchased both the Conte Rosso and eventually and considered purchasing the Gilear Treasury. They, they basically purchased the Conte Rosso though and went with that because her machinery is more complete. But they did consider, did the option was considered for both of them and there was a very real chance the Royal Navy would have ended up with two of these carriers. And they made that purchase in 1916, September 1916. But they'd actually been in talks about it and considering it as early as 1915. So then they start doing work. They start doing some initial work. And the initial work includes sending off design models to the wind tunnel of the National Physical Laboratory to be evaluated. Thankfully, that's when the Twin Islands and Bridge Over them disappeared. <laughs> they did testing. They went, this is not good. How do you mean not good? We mean, this is going to cause people to die. Uh, and the aircraft not to be operational. Oh, that's terrible. We won't do that then. No, 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 no. And I would like to point out that she's purchased in September 1916 officially. And the full models, and we're call, uh, cons talking very intricate models, are with the National Physical Laboratory for wind tunnel testing, all to scale, all to proportion, beginning of November. So theoretically, they, could, uh, they have done all that in about five weeks. The reality is it's been going on for a while and the models have been worked on for a while. And there are options with the models, thankfully. Thankfully. They tried a fully flush deck version as well, and that seemed to work better. They also looked at the island, and eventually the island model is what you end up going with. But that's a compromise. Because flush deck is the best for airflow. It does represent the most unimpeded for the airflow. It does create other issues of operation, which is why eventually the island is better. Basically, the island is a compromise because it's not as good for airflow. It interrupts the airflow, of course. But in terms of dealing with exhaust gases, in terms of con controlling the ship, in terms of providing a visual system for height above deck, for aircraft coming in, and in terms of all-around operation of the carrier as a ship, as a platform for aircraft to take off and land, uh, land for, on, all these things, the island actually represents a far better system. But they actually do full work, and the reason she goes flush deck is because of the trials with Furious, because... Again, they were considering going with an island structure, but of course Furious, and I'll be showing her in a second again, she has a taking off deck at the front and a landing deck aft, and she has a huge structure in the middle of her, and that, unsurprisingly, creates humongous issues with turbulence. Humongous. Saying this, though, her own stability is an issue. She has problems with rolling and she has a very high center of gravity because originally her hull is designed as an ocean liner. It's designed to be this sort of fast, uh, some, go uh, some go uh, goods in, uh, in uh, her hull, you know, hull uh, holds taking goods and passenger transport 
vessel which would go rocketing around the world, basically providing the equivalent of high-speed mass transit at the time. Or rather, high-speed intercontinental mass transit, or equivalent of the time. It worked. She was actually quite a useful vessel, and she is still... Well, she's actually... She's decommissioned officially in 1929. She's stuck in ordinary. She is recommissioned in July 1938. She's converted to an accommodation ship in 1944. And finally scrapped in 1946. She does do operations in World War II. Is she a great ship? Probably not. But she's one of the options being pursued. And this is the really interesting thing about the Royal Navy in this time period. They get to have their cake and eat it too. In World War One, they have enough budget and enough national interest that they don't just have to do design iterations and wind tunnel testing. They can literally do, we'll build the flush deck model, we'll build the central island model. Oh my lord, is it ugly. We'll build the island off to the starboard model. You know, all these things we will build. And we will see what will work. They do. They build them all. And then they settle on one, happily. But they do build them all. And you can argue that you can tell the point at which the Anglo-Japanese relationship breaks down, because for this, the Japanese are part of this. They've been over there, pilots off there, flying on it. But the fact that the Japanese end up going through a very similar development evolution themselves, instead of being able to take advantage of all the data coming from Britain, to me shows exactly when the relationship breaks down. And I know there's the simple mission, etc., which we'll be discussed later on. But one of the things you have to consider, again, with simple, is the simple mission is an official mission. It is an official mission. It is an interesting trade promotion mission. And yes, there are all sorts of issues which go on underneath it. And all sorts of issues which go on underneath it. But it provides the data that it was want given to provide. And some of that's good data. But not all it might have been. Furious at this point is in her, let's be honest, midlife crisis phase. If this is not a midlife crisis, I do not know what is. Because she's still got her, for want of a better phraseology, cruiser-inspired superstructure. But now they've built a carrier around it. Quite literally, built a carrier around it. This is in 1917. Interesting question here that I would love to postulate for people, and it's it's probably going to end up being the final question of this video, but it's I'll give you already an idea. What happens if Jackie Fisher, instead of going completely off the reservation, Courageous, Glorious, and Furious are actually built as carriers, and the British have the data already, they have been working on it. In the case of Argus, we can trace the data of her design back as far as, as, as some of the details, you know, go back to considerations going on in 1910, there's 1912 Beardmore designed as all the various ideas put forward by James Graham, the Duke of Montrose, who likes to patent various designs and ideas. You know, there's all sorts of work going on. There is a very real option. That Courageous, Glorious, and Furious could have been built as aircraft carriers from the get-go. And if you build them as carriers from the get-go, how do you build them? Interestingly enough, we can answer that question. This takes part in more testing, more development, but again, it's found that the island structure isn't really 
well, the structure, is, the superstructure, isn't really where you want it to be. And so we come with Hermes. Oh, guess what? She's ordered at roughly the same time. Her design is being considered along in parallel. She's finally ordered. Uh, realistically, it's it's officially it's the beginning of 1918, but they've been working on it and it's been finalised in funding terms in 1917. And if you look at it, they decided with the ship they're converting, they tried a full flush deck. With the ship they are mucking around with, i.e. Furious, they tried a whole central superstructure idea. With the ship they're building from scratch... Starboard Island structure. Because it's found that pilots turn to port when they're having an accident. When they want to get away from danger, they inst instinctively their hand does that and they go that way. So if that's the case, that's what you build. Which is really interesting for Courageous, Glorious and Furious because if they had been... If they had been built from the get-go as carriers, they are probably... And let's be honest, this is Jackie Fisher, so they're still going to be on the same scale. And there's a big difference. Hermes is built, and her overall length is 182.9 meters, or rather, exactly 600 feet. Whereas the length of HMS Furious, 786 foot 9 inches, or 239.8 meters long. In simple terms, and broadly speaking, she's almost 60 meters longer. Almost 60 meters longer. Okay, you can maybe, if I'm being, being exactly precise, uh, 56.9 meters longer. Mm, yeah, 56.9 meters longer. That's a lot of space. That's a lot of speed. This one's a 20 knot ship. Furious is a 30 knot ship. And this is the design. This is the design. This is the scale design the Royal Navy is working around. It doesn't look exactly like this at various points, but it's this is broadly speaking what we'd be talking about. It's got seaplane assistance and hatches on the back. It's got all the the big crane. It's got the forward island structure. It's got the big big. For some reason, fire control lookout system mast really up there on the tripod. And it has got armed. It's armed with six 5.5 inch guns and some 4 inch AA guns. Now, the thing is, on its 11,000 ton standard, it can get 20 aircraft. Of course, with speed of top speed of 25 knots. Furious, well, on her stand displacement of 22,900 tons, so roughly twice the displacement, carries 36 aircraft. And let's be honest, Furious is not as efficient a design. This is something which is often comes up in my discussions, okay? So let me explain what I mean by an efficient design. Because I get... Regularly, people are very upset me when I claim, uh, say Bismarck and Scharnhorst are not efficient designs, and the a lot of the German construction is not an efficient design. Mainly because they are designed by lots of committees, interfacing lots of committees and lots of politics, which means there's a lot of things included which might actually not be sensible to include. I, I would say it's far more efficient to go for a dual purpose armament that can do both your heavy AA and your anti surface system if you're on a ship, because it means you ha can have more of those guns, uh, one set of guns, so you can more of those. You have less less differential in terms of spares to maintain, less in training, and you can carry more rounds of ammunition. And it, it provides a far better defense in terms of, well, yes, you're having 20, 70% guns instead of 10, 90% guns. It, it works out better. When you're looking at a ship which is converted, in the case of Furious, 
because of where they're sticking the exhaust gases, etc., she can never take as many aircraft as Courageous and Glorious because of where they structure it. They actually build Courageous and Glorious with island structures. And they can take 48 aircraft. And they're still a conversion. And they're only a little bit heavier. They're 24,000 tons, 600 tons. You know, 24,600 tons, roughly, in standard. So, they're a little bit heavier, but they can take a dozen more aircraft. If you built those ships on Hermes lines, Hermes efficiency, but Hermes to their length and using their displacement, you could probably be accommodating 60 aircraft. And this is a really interesting thing, though. And as I said, the question I would do is, what happens if Jackie Fisher decides, as part of his Baltic plan, that what he really needs isn't those three, not battle cruisers, Fisher's Follies, whatever, you, large cruisers, whatever, light cruisers, whatever you want to call them, decides to actually build them as aircraft carriers? And Fisher actually could. This is a interesting thing because Fisher does consider aircraft carriers. He's one of the people pushing aircraft carriers in the Royal Navy and talking it up to both the Japanese and the Americans every chance he gets and every other ally because of the power of aviation to provide for that reconnaissance capability, that spotting capability, that defense against, that counter reconnaissance capability. And yes, the stop with Cuckoo and the strike capability is appreciated. That is a big thing of Furious. That is a big thing of them. It's it's certainly an interesting scenario because if we think about it, courageous and glorious and even Fur furious is completed. Of course, in a configuration as June nineteen seventeen, but courageous and glorious were completed in October nineteen sixteen. If Furious was following the exact same, rather than going with 18-inch guns, she could well have been completed at roughly the same time, which means the Royal Navy would have had three carriers with a combined air group of roughly 180 aircraft in, 19, in 1916. End of 1916. And the world could have changed. But, no. Fisher was a at best, radical conservative uh, in his in his approach to these things, as most development, defense development is, because let's be honest, the, the thing you can prove works is the gun. You know the gun works. You have lots of evidence, you have lots of information, you have lots of experience in making it work. You know it works. Aircraft are still being developed. They're still a new thing. But the Royal Navy's putting money into three different strands of carrier construction, they are testing out numerous different models at this point to try and work out what's best. And the Americans and Japanese are getting access to this information. This is the starting point of a lot of naval aviation development. And the reason it's combined, and the reason the British are combining at this point and are bringing the Americans and Japanese into it and sharing the information is to try and strengthen alliance with them. But also, broadly speaking, to try and uh, to try and guide their development so they don't do things which the British aren't expecting. I.e. they don't face a dreadnought movement moment provided by the Americans and Japanese because they've gone off on their own and developed something radically different. There's an advantage to giving people information. It tends to make them lazy, and you know what they know. And we have another carrier that being developed at this point. This is the Royal Navy going. Oh, we are going to need carriers. We're going to need lots of carriers. This point, the, the really interesting thing is they know war's not going to last that much longer. As I've said before, the Admiral class and a lot of the programs started in 1917, 1918 for major units are not about fighting World War I. They're about future wars. Nothing more dramatic in this than Eagle. Eagle is the Royal Navy 
rapidly going, right then, we need a ship. We have this ship. We can complete it as a battleship. We don't want to complete it as a battleship. We want another aircraft carrier. And we want one as rapidly as possible. And the thing is, this has got the engine in, it's got the systems, it's got all the plant, it's got all the hull. That's great. All we have to do is put the stuff on top of it. And there is a reason, therefore, when you look at Eagle and you line up, you go, hang on, they've literally just diverted the funnels to go, and they're sort of in the ship, and they go, we? That's all the Royal Navy has done in that. Put a hangar on top of it, built the island structure, in the service. You have HMS Eagle. And yes, it does take a while to actually commission. It's 1924 before she commissions. That's not because the work is necessarily complicated. It's because there is actually a debate over whether it should be an island structure or a um, flush deck structure like Argus. There is testing going on. And very quickly, the starboard island structure starts to take over. The one example of where it is still being debated and they're still considering it, and one reason why they push forward with Eagle like this, is Furious herself, but we're not going to see her next. We're going to see Hofschau, which is completed with an island structure, and then loses the island structure to become fully flush deck. Because the Japanese seed of HMS Furious being completed without it, and think, maybe... Maybe this works. Maybe this is a sensible idea. I actually prefer her with her island structure. But this is the Japanese going back and rapidly developing a fleet naval air arm. They go from seaplane carriers to a domestically built aircraft carrier. Started in 1920, completed in 1922, becoming the first ever purpose-built carrier to be commissioned. Because... Hermes again takes till 1924. That's a small pan there. They're both commissioned in 1924. They start them earlier. They could have completed them earlier. But war stops. Funding stops. Everything has to be reevaluated. Everything has to be proven to various governments. And it takes time. It's one of the quirks of fate that if World War One had gone on longer, it would have cost millions in lives, but more than likely things like Eagle, Hermes, would have been completed and would have been in service at war's end. Because they could be done fairly easily and fairly quickly under wartime work conditions and wartime procurement and financing conditions. It takes longer in peacetime because you have to justify it to more people. It's the same for the Japanese. You have to justify it to more people. You have to justify it to more people of voices. You have to explain it to more different points of view and you have to face the realities of costs far more than you do in, in wartime. In wartime, necessity is the mother of all invention. In peacetime, justification and cost-benefit analysis are the mother of all invention. And that's the reality when it comes to carrier development in this period. In wartime, necessity is driving everything. In peacetime, what's the cost-benefit analysis? What is really the beneficial methodology of us? What adds value? What gives us what we need? And so, this is what we're faced with. In America, they have the Langley. The Langley starts her process of conversion in 1920. And she is a converted carrier. She's not a purpose-built carrier. This is the thing about Hosho. She, like Hermes, is built from the keel up as an aircraft carrier. She's never going to be anything else. Her and Hermes are truly spectacularly important ships in that regard, as they are the first purpose-built carriers. And the flares, their bows, their hull lines, everything, it all tells you so much about what their navies are thinking carriers are going to be for, and carriers are going to be used for. 
let's be honest, Hermes, we go back to her, she's sometimes put forward by people as a fleet carrier. She isn't. She's 25 knots. Top speed. She's a cruiser carrier. She's a presence carrier. She's about providing aviation in those parts of the world. The Royal Navy doesn't have a lot of infrastructure to support aviation. Because they've already been experiencing operating that in World War One, off the coast of Africa, in the in Gallipoli, in various campaigns around the world, the Royal Navy's been operating aircraft and finding it really frigging annoying. You need infrastructure to support them, and the Royal Navy knows it's never going to get the money to build bases all over the place to support them. So you take that infrastructure with them. So you build a carrier. This is why Hermes looks like she is. This is why she is what she is. And this is why she spends quite so much of her life on the China Station. And even the Mediterranean Fleet. Because she is infrastructure included. It's the same with Eagle. Osho. She is about so many things. She truly is. Originally, she was supposed to be something like this, like Campania. I flying off deck forward and um, a seaplane carrier. That's what they were originally considering of when they were looking at Hosho and Shakaku. But things changed. The Japanese had access to a lot of information. The British were sharing with them the testing they were doing, the profile of the work they were going through, what was being developed and what was coming about. And they liked it. They liked the information. They liked what they were seeing. And they decided to go full carrier. As said, they started off with an island. Uh, but after watching what was happening on Furious with her <laughs> um, central stack island, and Argus, they decided to go flush deck. They removed the island structure. She's based on a large cruiser hull, and honestly, this makes a lot of sense for cruisers, for battle cruisers. The role is really being able to do high speed maneuvers and to be long range cruisers. And I didn't mean that in the terms of long range. Cruising around the world. Oh, that word really comes up so much and has so many different meanings in naval history and maritime history. It's so much fun. And again, this is why battle cruiser hulls, cruiser hulls were such good bases for carriers. Because what you need from the hull is broadly speaking what you need from a carrier hull. The only problem is that the center of gravity in design in a cruiser hull versus a carrier hull, it often relates when it's transferred in, changed into a carrier, the center of gravity goes too high. Why? Because a cruiser is designed to have armor, guns, large magazines full of ammunition and mechanisms which support their turrets or various other systems which go down into the hull. All these things provide extra mass going deep into the hull. Continuous flight deck, hangar, these things less so. One of the other interesting things, though, and this is something which is really interesting to consider her World War II performance and consider the reality of her, is they actually reduced her design speed to 25 knots based on British experiences in World War I. The same experiences which the British would later use to justify trying to increase and wanting to increase the speeds of their carriers and trying to figure out how to do that under the Washington and London Treaty limits, the Japanese, based on the information they received, actually reduced the speed of their carrier. Actually brought it down. It's intriguing as to why. And basically, I think it comes down to the fact that they, especially with the first generation of carriers, they're looking at support assets, not maneuver assets. They think of them standing off from a battle fleet, from a task force, providing aviation support, but not being close enough and not being a primary target themselves. As long as they stand off at a requisite distance. 
because the idea was the only thing that would be attacking them would be other ships. And, well, therefore, as long as the, their ships are between them and the enemy, there's no one going to attack them. And if they're making 25 knots away, then surely some of their own warships. If, basically, the idea is if you lost all the warships between you and the enemy, between your carrier and the enemy, you're in more trouble than just about to lose the carrier. You've lost your entire fleet. And that was the idea. The British, of course... Well, the British have an exercise in about 1927, 28. It's on the cusp of that period. And one of the cruisers, I think it was, I think it was one of the E-class, I think it was um, Emerald. I think it was Emerald. Basically bushwhacked all the Royal Navy carriers on one side. Because they were off, turning into the wind and wandering out, and no one expected the enemy cruiser to be where it was. And from that point on, the British went, Oh, frigate, we need to escort these. And also really started to decide that, yeah, it doesn't matter if we have 5-inch, 6-inch, whatever guns on these ships, there ain't no defending them in a gunfight. They do not, the uh, this whole scenario, they do not want to get into a gunfight. It was an interesting time for the Royal Navy, and a very interesting time for the um, Admiral in charge of the battle cruisers. because at the time, the Admiral in charge of battle cruisers was in charge of both battle cruisers and carriers. If I remember correctly, was actually in charge of the side on the excise that lost all their carriers. And basically, they were looking and going, not only have you lost your command, you're the person who's supposed to know will be working with these and thinking about these and have you lost them. And he went, well, I thought the battle cruisers were between them and the threat. And that's the problem. Very quickly, it starts percolating, and you have a de facto rear admiral aircraft carriers, and you have the actual rear admiral aircraft carriers in 1930 after that. And that's how things evolved for the Royal Navy. Joyous exercises. In America, the Langley... The Langley's different. Honestly, the U.S. Navy, when they are looking at the end of World War One, when they are working on all the information coming together, when they've got the treaty system already breathing down their neck, they want a carrier. They want something because they are late to the party. They are running, well, the same year, theoretically, as Hosho, but that's building a brand new one, not converting one. They're well behind the Brits in terms of the transition, and they didn't have even the excuse of having a war to focus their construction efforts on to drive their, their building process. They've done nothing. Why was this the case when the US Navy was one of the earliest adopters of naval aviation? They were one of the leaders. They were at the forefront. They were really pushing it forward. Honestly, trying to get Congress off the seaplane carrier kick. They'd really got onto that idea. They were really focused on them. And this is something you can actually see throughout the development of naval aviation in the United States. The trouble is, the US Navy might have the ideas to be very innovative, to want to push X, Y, or Z. But their political system is is more something of great momentum than necessarily great thought. And you often see this in some people's accusations of them, they're going, oh, they're doing this or this bad. And it's the same in most democracies. Once they get locked into a, tra a train of thought, a group think, you can either be for or against that thing, that thing. You can't think, well, hang on, are we doing the right thing? That becomes a fringe argument. For or against becomes the main thing, and it's a it's a great momentum. And so the U.S. Navy has to deal with this far more than the other powers involved. In Britain, of course, you have the advantage, for good or for ill, that the government always has a commanding majority in the Parliament, so they can push something through if they need to. 
realistically the biggest opposition in Britain to defence spending is always the Treasury. The biggest opposition to defence spending in America is usually the interests on the other side of the aisle. Or rather, what you're spending that money on. If one side's for one thing, the other side's going to be for the, the other, for the opposite of that. You can almost always guarantee it. It's very rare they'll come together. And this is not something new. This is not something which has suddenly evolved in our modern period. They used to be far more polite and respectful about it, and they used to be the arguments were far more articulate than various memes. But that's the modern world we live in. The moment the world came and dropped down to 140 characters or less, it got pretty interesting. But let's get on with the history. So, CV1, Curicum Vitae 1, Carrier 1. Ah, uh, the joys of being a historian, the jokes you can make. Starts life as USS Jupiter, a Proteus class collier, becomes USS Langley. The work started in 1920. And she'll be commissioned on 20th of March, 1922, just after the Washington Naval Treaty. She's named in honour of Samuel Pierpont Langley, who was an astronomer, physicist, aeronautics pioneer, an aircraft engineer. Not sure really how much he really has to do with the US, US Navy. He mainly spent his time trying to argue against the USN uh, observatories, dominance of time-keeping and time-setting, uh, and made his money trying to sell, well, actually profitably selling, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad and others, his time sales. Um, so they would have time zones and setting up those things. But he was incredibly popular with certain members of Congress. And this is even after he long since died. Uh, I think it's, he actually died in 1906. Sorry, mentally I was going, was it 1905 or 1906? I had to check my notes. It was February 1906. And, yeah. He was a fairly interesting gentleman. As said, his main issue associated with the Navy had been opposing the US Navy taking over and providing a standardized time system for the United States. But I suppose that earns him an aircraft carrier, so lesson to you all. If you want to get a carrier name for you, start out by arguing with the Navy. They don't respect you unless they're arguing with you, okay? Don't try and attack their actual funding. That will probably not get you a carrier, but Arguing about arguing about other things they're doing, which are off the route of March, that will get their attention, and then Congress will make them name a carrier for you, in order to reward you and show them that the civilians have the power. The Navy go, yeah, but we got the carrier. Who cares who you named it for? Now. I have to admit, this carry is pretty interesting. It's it's a flush deck design, of course, and it is quite a cool little ship. But it's also a very special ship, and that today we are talking about the inclusion of drones. Well, I'd like to tell you this: the U.S. Navy was at the forefront of having non-human a non-human aviation as part of its air group. Okay, because Langley was fitted out for three types of aviation. She was fitted out for seaplanes. She was fitted out for land planes, or what we normally refer to as carrier planes, i.e. wheeled undercarriage aircraft. And she was fitted out for pigeons. Because pigeons still mattered. Pigeons had been part of the operational capabilities and operational requirements of seaplanes for quite a long time. Uh, the idea was that the pigeons would provide information and manage to take information backwards and forwards. Initially, while well, she's fitted with this, and those pigeons are positioned in a special house at the stern between the five-inch guns. 
after some early experience of this, they decided that they weren't going to continue with it. And whilst the early plans for Lexington and Saratoga did include pigeon hospitality, luckily it was cancelled out quite quickly. And um, eventually the space on Langley was turned into the executive officer's quarters. Do we think someone didn't like the executive officer? Because think about that. That you see pigeons between five inch guns aft, and now the person aft, above the bits that are going to create the most vibrations and noise, between the five inch guns, which are the things which go bang and could cause issues, um, is the executive officer. Someone really didn't like him. Anyway, what's most interesting about it though is that the British idea. That carriers should be slow. That had been given to the Japanese and meant that Hosho had roughly five knots dropped off her speed because she, she was originally going to be 30 plus knots and she ends up 25 knots. Well, the Americans had considered that maybe the Proteus class speed of 15 knots was not going to be enough and they should maybe do something about it. No, no, no. With the Br information from the British, they decided 15 knots was fine. A few exercises later, they decided the British were absolute... That the British were absolute cruisers! <laughs> In fact, possibly frigating cruisers! Because 15 knots was not enough. And this is while the British were, of course, going around with Hermes, capable of 25 knots. Argos, 20 knots and considered a little bit on the slow side. Uh, Furious, 30 knots. Noticing a theme here going around here? Just a, just a small theme. And then, there's, of course, there's HMS Eagle, um, 24 knots. The British had convinced... Well, the Japanese 25 knots, I suppose, is in the mix, but, uh, yeah, that, that, see, information can be both a blessing and a curse. It really can be. Speaking of that, let's talk about HMS Furious, which, by 1925, had evolved into her final form, like some form of Pokemon. The evolution had happened. And... You might notice there's an interesting thing going on there, because when we look at a World War II version, oh my lord, is that an island structure that she's sporting? You are right, she is. Initially, she evolves and she has this sort of bridge structure, conning position. And, um, yeah, that was about as disappointing as you expected me. It also interferes in flying operations and means that just when you're doing the most difficult and complicated thing you can do on a carrier, operate aircraft, you have the least ability to see what you are doing and see what's going on from a single position. You are even more reliant on lookouts than ever. And Whilst, yes, traditionally the helms person cannot see, the helmsman can't see, uh, there's some great video. If you go to the video, uh, video of the Tribal Class Destroyer, I show it, the, the, the helm position, or destroyer, and there is no porthole ahead for the helmsman to look out. There is the ones to your side, but nothing ahead. It's a, a block of metal, and they literally are steering by compass bearing and instructions from the commanding officer alone. And that's good, because the commanding officer, navigating officer, officer of watch, are all going to be consulting various maps and charts to see where the likely problems are that you can't see below the waves, and hopefully to avoid them if those charts are correct. Well, there is, there is one scenario, though, where you do actually probably want the person 
steering the ship to be able to look out. You see, what a carrier does in this period when it's in task force operations, and it's in a wider task force, is it has to turn into the wind, especially before catapults, as we now call them accelerators, as they were called at the time, but catapults, as we now call them. Catapults were what fitted the ships to non-carrier aircraft, uh, non-carrier, uh, non-aircraft carrier ships that carried aircraft. Those were catapults, and to differentiate the systems put on carriers to assist with a launch of aircraft were called accelerators. It does make sense. Anyway. In that circumstances, the carrier has to turn into the wind. It has to signal everyone what it's doing. And pretty much everyone else has to get out its way. See, it's a small problem. You see, usually when you're doing that, it's in open ocean. And you've got a whole tar source moving around. And whilst they might be quite distant, you're going at quite a lot of speed. You have to go up to full speed. If you're doing Furious, you could be going up to 30 knots. Up to 30 knots to launch aircraft. In which case, you could run in to a destroyer and uh, sink it. Because it's also manoeuvring around you, it's supposed to be providing your protection. So there's this constant tug of war positioning going on. Interestingly enough, though, despite these particular predicaments, Royal Navy carriers didn't have a habit of running over destroyers. There were some close calls. They just didn't happen. Uh, however, Royal Navy, dis uh, Royal Navy battleships, specifically certain members of the King George V class, had a uh, productivity of it bordering on you wonder which side of the war they think they're on. Honestly, I, I think someone needed to go have a quiet conversation with HMS Warspite exactly o over exactly which side they were supposed to be fighting for and who exactly the destroyers were fighting for as well, and why one did not run them over. But that is just my inclination on the matter. So this is where we end. We've seen some of the development of the carriers in the early years. And the thing is, you might have noticed I've avoided talking much about operational doctrine. Because at this point there really isn't. The British have beginnings of stirrings. The Americans and Japanese have conceptions. But until you actually have something, use it, and find out its issues, as well as its advantages, but also it, most of all its issues, you can't really conceive of operations with it. You can't really work out what you can use it for. And that is a problem. So these carriers are interesting from the point of view of their discussions of how they're created and why they evolved. With Furious, she slowly evolves, and that makes her more inefficient than her other two sisters, because you've got refit building up over refit building up over refit, and talk to any good car mechanic, talk to any surgeon. You always want to get something done in the first surgery, in the first operation, the first fix. Because any time you have to go in and put a fix on a fix, it's guaranteed to be more risky and guaranteed to be worse. And more compromised. And Furious is a great example of this. Because on paper, she could have been actually, potentially a better ship than her two sisters. She's actually slightly bigger in some ways. And she could have been a really good carrier. But she wasn't. She was a terrible light cruiser. Absolutely atrocious light cruiser. There is no worse light cruiser design I can think out of there. The only thing, the thing that's getting close to it is the actual design for the Courageous and Glorious. As for calling them large light, light, light cruisers or light battle cruisers or battle cruisers, good lord, these are not that. In, light, in simple terms, Okay. With her single eight, two, if she even if she had both eighteen-inch guns, I would still have preferred to be on an invincible-class battle cruiser in a fight versus her than aboard her. And I know how bad the invincible class were. 
Okay, no one's pretending those are good ships. No one's pretending those are good ships to be in a fight. But you still have far more of a chance of winning a fight in them than you do her. Against her, definitely. In fact, the Invincible class wins... Every day of the weekend, twice on Sundays. I don't see me started on Tiger. She could have taken on all three of the ships and probably come out in one piece. But that's a Fisher rant. Not appropriate for this one. Because what's really interesting here is that Fisher and several of the other admirals around this point, and I'm going to do videos about them in more detail at some point this year, I'm going to do a Wednesday video as a forerunner of the year of leadership, which is going to be about all the World War I aviation admirals and talk about their different motives and ideas for getting into this. And please... Do comment below if you'd like to see that video, and I will... The more people that comment below they'd like to see it, the more I will try and make sure it's earlier this year rather than later this year. House move. Uh, house move, depending. But the thing is, what did Fisher really want when he's doing his Baltic plan? He wanted an edge. He wanted an edge. He wanted to push through the shallow water and give himself an edge in a fight. Well, as said... The Harwich Force can do that job. But the Harwich Force, coupled with some carriers providing reconnaissance, spotting for the uh, guns, and maybe also uh, maybe stopping enemy air, uh, zeppelins and reconnaissance aircraft spotting in, and who knows, maybe dropping some bombs or uh, tor even torpedoes if they've got some sort of cuckoos along, uh, alongside them to attack the enemy shipping. Yeah. That would have been an edge. That would have been an edge and a half. But he wasn't prepared to go that far. The interesting thing about Furious here is that picture is of a fairy barracuda. One of the most maligned aircraft in World War II, but actually one of the best that comes out of it. One of the best strike aircraft, one of the best torpedo bombers. Once it's finally done the way the, Br the Royal Navy wanted it to be, it is arguably one of the best aircraft available anywhere in the world in its time. And she's operating that for Operation Mascot. She's taking part in an attempt to sink the Tirpitz in 1944. This is an aircraft carrier which started off her life, started off her service, operating camels and pups, cuckoos, and finishes her service with barracudas. She takes part in the July 1918 raid on Tondam. And she takes part in Operation Mascot. When she takes part in the raid, she looks like... Well... This... She's there at the birth of naval aviation. And she's there when it comes of age. And you can't really blame admirals at the time for not seeing what the future was going to be. Think how many people who claim proclaim their futurologists and how many of them are actually ever right. Especially in terms of time scales. The Simpsons, Star Trek, all sorts of TV programs have a better chance of admitting the future due to sheer output 
and preparedness to think up wacky ideas that, you know, at some point, turn out to be actually viable. In 1918, they are doing wind tunnel tests like they've been doing in 1917, 1916, and 1915 to try and work out if an aircraft carrier can work. What I find amazing is that they're doing these tests at all. They didn't know what the future was, but they're doing the tests to try and figure it out. That's money, time, energy, all sorts of things. It's being put into it. And I think the really interesting thing for me, the thing that for me probably caused the most delay in the coming of age of aircraft carriers and the reason why the capital ship and other systems were not as adjusted to naval aviation by World War II as they probably should be, considering it's 20 years later nearly. is that these ships are still operational 20 years later. Ships which were experimental conversions, which if you consider in Royal Navy habit, usually survive less than five or six years of service operation before something new and shiny and built with all the information gained from testing and uh, testing and exercising this thing to an inch of its life get built come of age and then they're tested and exercised with an inch of their life and then everything else is adjusted them they don't have the chance to do that they don't have the opportunity to do that there are treaties there are all sorts of things in place and it's not the computer programs we have today they can't load up ultimate animal dreadnoughts they can't upload up world of warships and try an idea out Modern warships is slightly more difficult. I need to be able to control both teams, but we'll leave that to one side. They can't do that. What can they do? They can put something on paper. They can do a forward exercise, a discussion. They can build it and actually test it. And if you take away the building of it, and their ability to build it as they want to, you take away a huge part of their development capability huge cornerstone of their development capability. They're good ships though. All these are interesting ships. I'm so looking forward to the key ships about them. Right, what have we got to come up? Next week? Next week. We have Conception Operation Conclusion of the Atlantic Conveyor and other rapid conversions. I thought it'd be fun. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Oh, and while I remember, not in time, not in time because of that, uh, because of uh, this, I always do put in question end, and I know I've already mentioned it, but the question is, what happens if Fisher goes full rapscallion? And decides to do free aircraft carriers with the courageous, glorious, and furious instead. What happens to the world? As I said, I think at the time, considering the size of aircraft at the time, etc., I think you could easily have 60 aircraft aircraft carriers. 60 aircraft capacity within the hangar. You wouldn't have deck parking. So you're not going to have those numbers. And British hangars are unlikely to be designed big enough at that time. They're, they're going to be Hermes. If they're going anything, they're going Hermes-sized hangars. And Hermes, if we consider her, had a 400 foot by 50 feet wide, a 50 foot wide, 400 foot long, and 16 foot high hangar. So it's quite a nice space hangar. Decent sized. If we consider again, that's roughly two thirds of her length. She's a 600 foot long ship. She's got a 400 foot long hangar. If you go with Furious, 
She's a 786 foot, 9 inches long ship, so, well, let's be honest, uh, that's roughly 520 foot, because it's 180 foot under 600, I know, okay, there's technically two more feet in it, so two more feet and six inches, uh, no, hang on, four more feet and six inches in it, so it's... 524 foot 6 inches long hanger. If you go for exactly 2 thirds length. If you consider their beam, they're slightly, they're slightly beamier. So they could, uh, she could probably, uh, the hanger could certainly be beamier. Certainly. Because uh, her beam's 70 foot 3 inches. And the beam of the Furious is 88 foot. And, well, again, if you consider the hanger size, they're 50, it's a 50 foot wide hanger. So, again, it's a roughly... Uh, that's more than two thirds, isn't it? Oof. That's five sevenths. So... Maybe 60 foot wide hanger. If they're building it from new on that same scale, thirty knot ship, because BTE Fisher would want it to be fast. Could be an interesting vessel. And anyway, I thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll look forward to seeing your response to the question. Take care. Also, um, if you want to. Add in a comment about what you think it would uh, do in any kind of Baltic plan, whether it would actually be a good idea for uh, Fisher's Eye at Dream. Almost forgot, if you liked the video, please do like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Remember, this channel is nothing about your support, and certainly not the books I'm currently stacking up in the boxes behind me. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be around or be as, having as, as much of a fun life without all your kindness. And, um, yeah, for those who like to support the channel more directly than just watching, there's Patreon and Ko-fi and there's membership. Thank you very much for everyone who does for everything you do. Really wouldn't be possible to do without you. Take care.